I started reading the Bible, but I just got lost in all the genealogy. You know, who begot who. Who was Melchizedek? Where did he come from? The book of Revelation just scares me. I mean, does anybody really understand all those symbols? Who are the judges? Like, do they really matter? I've never understood which book came first. Is there a way to read the Bible so it makes sense? I'd like to welcome you to our Father's Plan. My name is Jeff Cavins, and I'm here along with Dr. Scott Hahn, and we're going to be co-hosting a series of programs here on EWTN, uh, discovering the beauty of the Bible, taking a look at salvation history, specifically our Father's plan for your life. And I'd like to welcome you, uh, Dr. Scott Hahn from Franciscan University. Good to be with you. I'm excited because this is going to give us the opportunity to make the Bible come alive. Isn't it unusual that you'd have two ex-Protestant ministers, it's unusual but exciting to have two uh, ex-Protestant ministers together on a Catholic network talking about the Bible. Yeah, both of whom shared many misunderstandings and uh, uh, opposition to the, the Catholic Church on the basis of the Bible until we studied the scriptures and discovered the Catholic faith. I'm looking forward over the, the next series of programs of sharing uh, with the, the, the folks on EWTN on the beauty of scripture, salvation history. What I'm hoping to do over the next uh, few sessions is make the, the Bible understandable for the layman. You know as well as I do that when you first start off reading the Bible, it can seem very, very complex. And mm -hmm. what I hope to do in my segment of the program, uh, which is the first half, is to take all of those complex events of the Bible, all the way from Genesis to Revelation, and break those events down into 12 manageable parts and then to walk through each one of those, those 12 points or parts of salvation history, we're going to use 14 of the 73 books in the Bible. And those 14 books are going to be the historical books that take us through salvation history. So on my segment of the program, I hope to take the people through a, on, a, on a journey through salvation history so that they can get the big picture of our Father's plan. What are you hoping to do? And by the way, I've seen you do this before. I've seen <laughs> students respond. It's, 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 it's incredible. It's exciting. Uh, what you do is focus more upon the external structure of the Bible that people need to grasp if they're going to come to grips with the internal content. What I'm going to shift to is the internal content focusing principally upon the theme of the covenant, which really is the overarching theme of the Bible, and showing how the covenant understood as a family bond between God the Father and we, his family, how that makes the Bible come alive, how that makes the Bible make more sense, and it also makes the Bible very practical for our own everyday life as well. Mm -hmm. How have you found the scriptures to be uh, uh, a key for, for you to come into the church? How, what role did they play in you coming into the church? Well, they were the reason I became a Catholic. Uh, they were the key for me overcoming so many misunderstandings. You know, if it wasn't for the Bible, you know, I wouldn't know Jesus Christ, but I also wouldn't know the church that he established. And so, you know, you look to the Bible as a convert, and you just, it, it, words can't express the gratitude and appreciation you feel. And I don't just feel this alone. You know, we're part of network and organization with over a hundred Protestant ministers who through Bible study and prayer have come into the Catholic Church. It's an exciting movement that we're a part of. I know, Dr. Hahn, that your teachings played a big role in my coming back to the church. I left the church when I was about 20 years old, became a Protestant pastor for 12 years, and it was through your teachings that really, it really woke me up to the, the beauty of Scripture, and by the way, some of the concepts that you're going to be sharing on uh, the subsequent programs about the family of God and how the Catholic Church really is an expression of God's family and His love for us as a father. And so I really encourage our viewers to, to tune in in the, in the coming programs because they're in for a treat with what you have taught. And I think that there's many people out there that have, uh, have, have toyed with the idea of coming back to the Catholic Church. They've left the Catholic Church because they were rebellious or because they were just angry. But I would invite our listeners to really listen to the Word of God, specifically what you're going to be sharing and be open to what the Lord is saying. 
We are excited about this series, and we, enjoy, we uh, invite you to join us on Our Father's Plan. We want to welcome you back to Our Father's Plan. It is indeed a privilege to share with you the joy of Scripture. You know, it was in 1977 that I had a real conversion experience to Jesus Christ. And one of the first things I did after that experience is I went out and I, I bought my very first Bible. It's right here. It's been a good Bible for a number of years. And I remember going out and reading that Bible and consuming it. I, I couldn't get enough of it. It was like it, it came alive for the first time in my life. Well, over the next series of programs, we're going to be talking about the Bible and how to read the Bible. You know, the, the New Catechism of the Catholic Church says that the Scripture is a letter written by our Heavenly Father to His children for the purpose of revealing Himself to them. And what we're going to talk about over the, the next few sessions is how to read the Bible, because the Bible is an exciting adventure. I want to share with you some practical ways to read the Bible. After my conversion experience, I would open up the Bible and I would start to read, but to be honest with you, I didn't know where I was. It was exciting and I felt like God was speaking to me, but it didn't make sense as a story. A little bit later on in this program, I'm going to give you the keys to reading through the Bible in chronological order, and I think you'll find it very exciting. But first, I'd like to talk a little bit about the Bible. You know, the Scriptures as I said earlier, is a personal letter written by God for you. God wants to reveal Himself to you. God reveals Himself to man in the Scriptures gradually. The New Catechism says that He reveals Himself by words and deeds. He not only says that He loves us, He shows us that He loves us. So it's important for the modern Catholic reading the Bible to understand that when they read the Bible, they're reading a book of history. History becomes very important to the Christian, for it is in actual human events that God reveals His will to us. I like what Pope Paul VI said in the New Catechism. It says that the history of salvation is being accomplished in the midst of the history of the world. So the Bible gives a wide range of examples on how God, through word and deed, has gradually entered the life of His people. You might ask the question, why should I read the Bible? What, why should I read it? Why, why is it important to me? And number one, I would say that the Bible, for, you, for us as Catholics, is our most precious family heirloom. I want to read a few scriptures to you that talk about how you and I, once we became Christians, were adopted into God's family. I'm reading from Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 5. The scripture says that He destined us in love to be His sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of His will. And then again, the Apostle Paul, he writes in Romans 8 and verse 15, For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. So you see that God tells us in Scripture that through Christ we have been adopted into His family plan, which started long ago with Israel as the firstborn. The Apostle Paul goes on to teach in Romans chapter 11. He says, If some of the branches have been broken off, and you, though a wild olive shoot, have been grafted in among the others, and now share in the nourishing sap from the olive root, those who have come into the Catholic family have a new history. And I, I, I woke up to that back in 1977 that as a, as a person who had a conversion experience, I have a new family. I have a new heritage. Israel's history is now also Catholic history. I'll read a couple more scriptures. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 6, Paul says, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one family one body and shares together in the promise in Christ Jesus. He goes on, he says in Romans chapter 4, that Abraham is the father of us all. I like what Pope Pius XI said. He made a striking observation when he said that spiritually we are all Semites. Now the reason I read all of that to you 
is to show you that you and I as Catholics have been adopted into God's family plan. And the Bible for us now becomes our most, our most uh, uh, precious family heirloom. It's a book that we need to be in. We need to, we need to understand. Now, most people would not be captivated by reading the history of some other ethnic group other than their own. But we, as Catholics, our imagination should be captured by the Bible because it is our book. I'd like to talk to you just for a few minutes about how to read the Bible and understanding the big picture of Bible history. As mentioned earlier, Scripture is a, a letter written by our Heavenly Father to His children for the purpose of revealing Himself to us. But unfortunately, many of us leave the Bible on our shelves at home. In fact, it's the number one bestseller in the world, but it oftentimes sits on our bookshelf at home and we don't read it. There's a lot of reasons why we don't read it. Some of us don't understand it. We don't, we don't understand how it applies to, to our lives. In the people that I have talked to, uh, the common denominator is that people simply do not understand how to read it. When you ask someone if you study the Bible, they give you sort of a funny look. Because you see that studying the Bible presupposes that you know how to read the Bible. Well, that's what we want to talk about in this first segment. And then in the following segments, the following programs, we want to walk through salvation history. The Bible is really a library of 73 books, yet it's one book. It's many stories, but yet it's one story. More than 40 authors over a period of 1,600 years, covering thousands of years of history. The problem for most of us as we pick up the Bible and read it is that it doesn't read like a novel. It doesn't read like Gone with the Wind. And so we pick it up and we open it Genesis and we read all the way through Revelation, but we don't have a sense of continuity. We don't have a sense that we really understand what I call the big picture of Bible history. It seems scrambled. And yet in that scrambled library of 73 books, there's one story. And it's your story as a Catholic. And we are encouraged in the New Catholic Catechism to read the scriptures, to consume the scriptures, to live in the scriptures, to be soaked in the scriptures. In fact, the Catechism teaches us that to be ignorant of the scriptures is to be ignorant of Christ. How many of you have gone through a reading through the Bible program in a year? I know I've started many. And what we do is we, we want to wait till January. And we're going to read through the Bible this year for sure. We're excited about it. So we go out and what do we do? We buy a brand new Bible because the other one didn't seem to work. And we get a new notebook to keep some notes in for that, that new year of Bible reading. Get a pen that feels just right. We're all set. January 1st rolls around and we start reading Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 2, and Genesis chapter 3. But then right around March, we quit. Why? Yeah, we we're in Leviticus, and Leviticus doesn't seem to minister to us in our, in our daily devotions like some of the other books do, and we end up giving up. What I want to do in the next few minutes is give you the keys to reading through the Bible so that it makes sense in chronological order. If I was to ask you, how many of you have heard, have you heard of Abraham? How many of you have heard of David? How many have heard of Saul? Jesus, Timothy. Many of you would say, yes, I've heard of them. But if I was to ask you the question, what is the relationship between Abraham, Moses, David, Jesus, at that point, there would be a breakdown. We don't know the relationship from one story to the other. Well, what I'm going to do is give you the keys here and show you how to read through the Bible in chronological order. And I have a little memory device that I'd like to introduce to you called a memory, a Bible, memory Bible timeline band. It's called a timeline band. It's a little bracelet that we devised to help people memorize the different periods of salvation history and to also uh, memorize the historical books to read through the Bible. Now, what I want to share with you is this. We're going to take all of the events of the Bible, hundreds and hundreds of events, and we're going to break them down into 12 historical periods. And you may see behind me that I have a chart with different periods of Bible history. We're going to go through each of these 12 periods in our next show and in the following shows. We have the history of the early world, the patriarchs, Israel and Egypt, the conquest of Canaan, the judges. We also have the United Kingdom, the divided kingdom, the exile, the return, and the Maccabean revolt. In the New Testament, we have the period of Jesus and the church. 
as the church grew. Along with this little mnemonic device, the memory device, we have a little card, and I'll tell you a little bit about this later and how you can receive one of these from EWTN. But we have break, broke down all of Bible history into 12 periods, and each period receives a color so that you can memorize that period. We also broke down the, all of the 73 books of the Bible into 14 books. All you have to read is those 14 books, and they'll take you in narrative form from the beginning of the Bible to the end. That's all you have to read. And I have a chart behind me that explains a little bit about that. This chart entitled 14 Chronological Books of Bible History outlines the 14 books that you need to read in order for you to capture the big picture. As I said earlier, many people start in Genesis and they go all the way to Revelation and they become very, very confused because it doesn't read like Gone with the Wind or another novel. So what we're doing is this. We're lining up the 14 books that continue the narrative. In other words, the story continues one story after another, after another, after another. And then on this little handout that you can receive, and we'll be talking about more, I show you where the other books fit in, 59 other books that are not historical. And let me just add that by historical, I mean that it keeps the continuity moving, the narrative keeps moving. And those 14 books are Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Joshua, Judges, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, Ezra, Nehemiah, 1st Maccabees, Luke, and Acts. If you will read those 14 books, you will capture the big picture of Bible history. And what I recommend to people is that they, first of all, read through those 14 books. And the next time that they read through the Bible, for example, when they come to 2 Samuel, rather than uh, just moving on, perhaps you want to read a few Psalms during 2 Samuel and you will get a better idea of the context that the Psalms take place in. The Bible becomes really exciting. In our subsequent programs, we're going to be talking about each period of salvation history and going through these 14 books together. And what I would like to do is highlight some key concepts, some important events in each period of Bible history that will help you move through salvation history. I'm confident that the Bible be can, can become understandable to you and can minister to you on a daily basis. I am so excited about the scriptures. My whole family participates in a daily scripture reading where we read through the Bible together. It's nurtured my 11-year-old daughter and my wife and I, we both enjoy it very, very much. So I'm looking forward to uh, going through this adventure with you as we see God uh, uh, reveal himself in salvation history. I want to invite you to come on this venture with me. I have a favorite metaphor that I, that I enjoy sharing, and that is that uh, each period of salvation history, which we're going to be going through, the history of the early world, the patriarchs, Israel and Egypt, and the conquest of Canaan, they are all matched with a historical book, Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and so forth. The, the metaphor of mine to better understand the church relationship to Bible study is what I call the train trip. And it's, uh, uh, the train trip is treating the 14 historical books like tracks for a train to ride on. When you take these 14 historical books, which I have here on the chart, each one is like a train track. You lay them out one after another, and it'll take you all the way through salvation history. But the interesting thing is, is that you don't have to go on this journey alone. You see, many people have gone down this journey, on this track through salvation history before you. Not only all the popes, Pope John Paul II and Pope Paul VI and so forth, but Jerome and Augustine, the fathers of the church, they have all gone down this track before of salvation history, and they have so much to contribute. And so I want to encourage you, if you're afraid of reading the Bible, Perhaps you uh, feel a little shaky about, about reading it. Will I understand it? The first step is to start reading it. Go on this journey through salvation history. You're not alone. The Catholic Church is there with you. You know, the Catholic Church teaches that the Word of God comes to us through Scripture and through sacred tradition. The magisterium, 
which is the bishops in line with the Holy Father, are there to teach us and to instruct us and guard the sacred deposit of truth. And so you're not alone. So I invite you over the next uh, number of shows to come with us on a journey through salvation history. What I am going to be doing is I'm going to be taking you from the history of the early world all the way on through Jesus and explaining some of the key concepts. Now, Dr. Hahn is going to be in the, uh, talking to you in the second half of the program about some key concepts that are important to understand, key theological concepts, which will help you understand the Bible in more depth. Some people have said that, that I'm like a water skier. I'll take you over the surface of the Bible, the 14 historical books. We'll zoom over the surface, whereas Dr. Hahn will go down deeper. He's like a deep sea diver. He'll go down three or 400 feet, and he may stay there a while and share with you some of the exciting, dynamic, theological concepts in the Bible. I'm excited to share this series with you. I know that the Bible has changed my life drastically. And uh, I left the Catholic Church a number of years ago and I became a Protestant pastor. But I returned to the Catholic Church and the scriptures were the reason. I saw the truth in the scriptures as they pertain to the Catholic Church. And so I come to you with a great excitement and zeal. I'd like to share with you how you can obtain the packet from EWTN. All you need to do is write or call EWTN and ask for the Bible Timeline Band Packet. And what you're going to receive is you're going to receive the bracelet which has the 12 periods of Bible history and the laminated card which will take you through the 14 historical books and those 14 historical books will take you through the 12 periods of salvation history. You'll also receive three handouts inside and one of the handouts is this chart right here. It will show you the 14 historical books. It will also show you the books that you should read in the context of those 14 historical books. For example, you can see that during 2 Kings, many of the prophets speak. But if you don't know that, those prophets will be lost to you. We'll talk more about that as we get into our, our, uh, our segments up ahead. You'll also receive in the packet an entire page of instructions on how to read through the Bible. And you will also read some or get some outlines, receive some outlines, so that each period of salvation history I will provide for you uh, about nine major events in that period to memorize. My students in the past have memorized all 12 of these periods of salvation history. My daughter did at a very young age. And this provides a framework, along with the 14 historical books, for a lifetime of adventure in the Bible. You will build a solid foundation on which you can study on and add to the rest of your life. When you listen to a lecture like Dr. Scott Hahn and, and some of the other fine scholars in the Catholic Church today, you need a framework on which to attach that information. These 14 historical books and the 12 periods will give you that. We'll be back right after this. <laughs> Jeff Cavins has just done a masterful job of introducing the importance and method of studying Scripture by looking at the historical books to trace the way in which God fathers His family in salvation history. He also did a good job of introducing my segment by pointing out that we're going to be going scuba diving. We're not going to be racing along the surface uh, as water skiers. We're going to be snorkeling. We're going to be going deeper into the Bible. Before I do that, though, I want to reinforce some of the points that Jeff has stated. First of all, I want to make it perfectly clear that for the Catholic Christian, Scripture study is an essential part of spiritual growth. For the ordinary Catholic, not just for the superstar. In Vatican II, we have a statement that is so important, quoting from the great Saint Jerome, ignorance of Scripture is ignorance of Christ. That's ignorance that nobody can afford. In that same document, Dei Verbum, the fathers of Vatican II said this, sacred theology rests on the written word of God together with sacred tradition as its primary and perpetual foundation. And it goes on to add that the study of the sacred page is, as it were, the soul of sacred theology. So if you think of theology as a body of doctrine, realize that a body needs a soul. A body without a soul is a corpse. A soul without a body is a ghost. 
Together, theology and scripture go hand in hand, and scripture is the soul of theology. It's what animates it. it it's what makes doctrine come alive. In fact, after Vatican II, the Sacred Congregation for Catholic Education issued a document entitled The Theological Formation of Catholic Priests, in which it states this, sacred scripture is the starting point, the permanent foundation, and the life-giving and animating principle of all theology. And it cites that document in Vatican II, Dei Verbum, and it goes on to say, since scripture is passed on to us by the church, and in part came into existence within the church, it requires to be read and understood in the light of ecclesiastical tradition, that is, the living sacred tradition that is enshrined in the Catholic Church. It goes on, the primordial role of sacred scripture determines the nature of its relation to theology and its various disciplines. Well, what does that mean? Well, the document doesn't leave us to wonder because it says in conclusion that the teaching of sacred scripture must culminate in a biblical theology which gives a unified vision of the Christian mystery. What is this Christian mystery? It is, for all intents and purposes, our Father's plan. It's a family plan for the children of God, sons and daughters of the Most High, for that is who we are. Now, in discussing this particular approach to the Bible, our Father's plan, I'd like to lay out for you certain foundational principles. The first one is quite simple. God as our Father. The fatherhood of God is not something that is always understood correctly. A lot of people just assume that God is our Father just because God made us. But it's important to realize that God is our creator and being creator is different than being a father. I could create a statue, but I'm not that statue's father. Even if that statue looks just like me, on the other hand, if I generate a child, of which I've done five thus far with God's grace, those five children don't look anything at all like me, and yet I am not their creator so much as I am their father. There's an important difference between being made and begotten. In the creed we say of Jesus Christ that he was begotten, not made. That is, from all eternity, God fathered the Son. On the other hand, we'd have to say about ourselves that we are made by God as he is our creator and we are his creatures. We are made, not begotten. It isn't until God gives to us divine grace that we are empowered to become children of God and thereby God becomes our Father. Last century, there was a, a heresy known as modernism, liberalism. It went by different names, but the slogan for it was the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. It skipped over this essential point that God is our Father, but only through the mercy and grace that he gives us. The second foundational principle, besides God as our Father, is salvation as divine sonship. That is, salvation is more than just being forgiven of sin. Salvation is more than just escaping the fires of hell. Salvation is more than just enjoying the blessings of heaven. Salvation is nothing less than sharing the very life of God. That is the meaning of supernatural grace. That is the purpose and plan of our Father in sending His Son, Jesus Christ, to redeem us. The fullness of redemption isn't captured until you've gotten beyond mere forgiveness, beyond the, the health-giving and life-giving benefits of salvation. Salvation climaxes in our participation in Jesus' own eternal divine sonship. Now that's a lofty concept, and we're going to have to spend a lot of time unpacking that in order for that to make practical sense in our own everyday lives, as well as for that to become devotionally useful for our own prayer with God our Father. The third foundational principle is we're going to focus upon the covenant. The covenant as the overarching theme of the Bible and the covenant as the unifying principle for interpreting all of Scripture. Salvation history takes place over thousands and thousands of years, and sacred scripture 
encompasses thousands and thousands of pages. And I don't need to tell you that reading the Bible and grasping the essential message of salvation history can be quite overwhelming. It is still even for me. But how can we make sense of all of the data, all of the names we find difficult to pronounce, all of the places we may never visit, all of the events that involve circumstances we'll never really know firsthand? Well, I am convinced coming to grips with the covenant is an essential prerequisite for grasping, for appreciating, and for really living out the message of the Bible, for seeing that salvation history did not stop when Jesus Christ came. It didn't cease when the last apostle died out. We are still standing midstream in the middle of this great flow of salvation history. Salvation history continues on through the 20th century and into the 21st century, through the second millennium and on into the third, and we're a part of it. And we have to appreciate how salvation history is our family history, how God is fathering his family, and God is a father who keeps his promises. He is a father who keeps covenant with us. So the fourth foundational principle, quite simply, is this, that the church can be understood in many ways, can be understood as the sheepfold, or as a kingdom, or as a building, or as a field. The Bible uses many metaphorical images to describe the church. But there is a sent, there's, a, there's an essential way in which the church can be understood most simply and profoundly as the family of God that flows from God as our Father, that flows from the reality that He gives us by the grace of divine sonship, which is our salvation which expresses itself in the covenant that binds us to him that we call the new covenant. The Catholic Church is the worldwide, age-old family of God. And i got to tell you, to be honest, this is not something I've always believed. I used to be Protestant, but I didn't just used to be a Protestant. I used to be an anti-Catholic Protestant. In fact, I was an ardent anti-Catholic. But I was so committed to the Bible that I wanted to believe whatever God revealed in Scripture. And over a period of years, the study of the Bible led me to the conviction that the Catholic Church is the family of God. Now, in looking at the church, in looking at the covenant, in looking at divine sonship, we can see all of this flowing from God as our Father. Understanding God as our Father that is critically important because it tells us who God really is in himself. You know, we can think of God as creator, as lawgiver, as lord and master and judge. And he is all of those things. But he's only those things in relationship to us, his creatures. But we ought to wonder then, what is God apart from creation? Apart from law giving, apart from judgment, what is God in himself? What was God before creation? Now, of course, God is outside of time, so for God there is no beforeness as such. But we can still answer the question who God really is in his essence because that's what the mystery of the Blessed Trinity is all about. You see, God from all eternity really is a father. And we know that along with a central truth that is secondary, that is, God eternally fathers Jesus Christ. That is why the early church had to condemn as heresy the notion that there once was a time when Jesus Christ was not the son. No. God is father. God is eternal father. So God has eternally fathered an eternal son, Jesus Christ. And the bond of love, the gift of life that binds the Father and the Son is the Holy Spirit. So in God, we not only see that fatherhood is original, perfect, and eternal, we see that God is an interpersonal communion of life-giving love. In short, God is an eternal family. 
That isn't just some quaint metaphor that we made up. Fatherhood is not just some image that we took from our experience and projected up into infinity in order to, you know, make God more knowable, to domesticate the deity, to unscrew the inscrutable. Not at all. God as Father is the essential foundation of our faith. And it's what really makes the Catholic religion so unique. Pope Pius XII once underscored this point when he said, the Christian religion is the unique religion of divine sonship. Now, we've laid out these foundational principles. God as our Father. Salvation as divine sonship. The covenant as the overarching theme of salvation history and the interpretive principle for unifying scripture and the church as God's family. What can we do with this practically? In other words, what can you take from this lesson today and begin to live out in the days and the weeks and months to come? I would suggest one particular application. When I was a non-Catholic, when I was an anti-Catholic, I was still a student of scripture focusing upon covenant. Ever since the Protestant Reformation, however, the covenant has been understood primarily in terms of the courtroom. We're going to look and see how the Bible, better understood, presents the covenant in terms of the family. But while I thought of it, much like Martin Luther did, in terms of the courtroom, I thought of God primarily as judge. I thought of sinners primarily as guilty defendants who were acquitted by virtue of Jesus Christ's redeeming work. Now, all of that is true in one sense, but I would suggest that it has to be subordinated to a higher principle, and the higher principle, once again, is that the covenant is a sacred family bond. So the covenant means that God is primarily a father. Now, does this mean, does this imply a lower or less strict standard of justice? On the contrary, because a father requires more from a son or daughter than a judge does from a defendant or a lawgiver from citizens. So I would suggest to you that thinking of the covenant as a sacred family bond that binds God the Father to us as his family is the key for understanding the Christian faith. For instance, sin is often misunderstood. And I think we need to radically rethink the essential meaning of sin because sin is not essentially mere disobedience of commandments. If you see that sin is the violation of certain laws, but those laws come from the covenant, and that covenant is a sacred family bond that our Father establishes, then we can see that the law is more than just an arbitrary set of stipulations. The law is an expression of the Father's wisdom. The law and all the commandments are an expression of the Father's love. And the law comes to us on the basis of fatherly authority. So the essence of sin, then, is not mere disobedience. It is the refusal of divine sonship. Likewise, righteousness then does not consist exclusively of an obediential uh, approach to laws, much like a servant would relate to a master. On the contrary, righteousness consists of trusting the lawgiver as a son trusts the father, that the father wants the best for his children, that the father wants to give nothing less than himself his own life, his values, his property, his time, his all. Because within the family, love is life-giving. And within God, that life-giving love is infinite. It's perfect and it's eternal. And so as we relate to God in terms of sin and righteousness, as we come to grips with the call that Jesus issues for repentance and faith, realize that the essential response of faith is not simply trusting that Christ's death will atone for my sins. No, 
The reality of faith is the dynamic trust of a son toward a father. We can absolutely entrust ourselves to God as a father. Whatever he says, we will believe because he has spoken it. And so, in living out our faith in a daily way, we ought to contemplate in just the ordinary moments of life the fact that we're not just creatures, we're not just sinners who have been saved by God's mercy, we are sinners who have been saved and elevated to full-fledged membership in God's family by covenant. God is bound to us as his children. So all of the judgments, all of the, the punishments that come to us are expressions of fatherly love, fatherly discipline. This helps us also then correctly understand how God relates to me today. I think sometimes we have a very dangerous and mistaken notion of how God's wrath is expressed. We don't relate God's wrath to a loving father so much as an ogre, and we've got to stay off his bad side. I would suggest to you that God's judgments and punishments are perfect justice, but they're punishments that fit the crime. St. Thomas Aquinas once explained this in a way that I found almost shocking at first until I really considered it prayerfully. For instance, St. Thomas says this, that God punishes us for not overcoming our faults by giving us temptations. Whenever we refuse to fight our own weaknesses, the natural consequence is we're going to be tempted. And if then we do not struggle to overcome temptation, God's punishment once again fits the crime. The punishment for temptation not being fought is sin succumbed to. Well, then how does God punish sin? What is his just wrath revealed against sin? You discover this by reading Romans 1, 17 to 32. Over and over again, St. Paul describes how God gave them over to their lusts and to their disordered desires. You see, St. Thomas explains that God's punishment for sin is the pleasure that we experience when we commit that which ruptures the family bond between us and our Father. God punishes us by allowing us to experience illicit pleasures. And then the punishment for enjoying these illicit pleasures is what? The punishment for enjoying illicit pleasures sinfully is the addiction, the attachment, the idolatrous yoke that enslaves us to sin. Now, wait a second. This really turns things upside down, doesn't it? Because we don't usually think that God allowing a sinner to prosper in his sin is punishing the sinner. But if you understand the covenant in a family and fatherly way, this is exactly the conclusion you'll reach, just like St. Thomas Aquinas. So then, pray tell, what is God's mercy? Well, it's God's mercy that causes us to get arrested, to get fined, to get fired, to get caught. If you ever attend Alcoholics Anonymous meetings or any meeting where honest sinners will stand up and admit what it took for them to turn around and to discover God is truly a, lo a loving and wise father, invariably they'll say it's because they hit rock bottom. And God loves us as a wise father enough. He loves us enough sometimes to let us hit bottom. And so, in preventing sinners from prospering in their sin and thereby becoming addicted, attached, enslaved to that sin, by forcing us almost, involuntarily sometimes, to come face to face with the real moral consequences of sin in our own marriage, in our own family, in the workplace, in our own friendships, God once again shows us that his law 
is a prescription for our spiritual fitness. And that the virtues he calls us to exercise are essential for maturing as sons and daughters of God the Father in his family. This, I am convinced, could reshape the way we live, the way we think, the way we pray, and the way we share our faith with other people. Because I'm convinced that the Holy Spirit who dwells within our soul, the Holy Spirit that St. Paul calls the spirit of sonship there in Galatians 4, gives to us a compelling desire to share the glorious love of God with others. We're not just out to win arguments. We're not just out to understand the Bible better for intellectual purposes alone. We are out to reach the end for which we were made. Now, the primary model for understanding the covenant is the family model. That much is clear from a careful study of Scripture, and it's interesting. After years of study, I've discovered that scholarship coming from Jewish and Protestant, as well as Catholic sources, reinforce this basic and fundamental point. What is the point? That the family model of the covenant does better justice, so to speak, to the Bible's teaching than the courtroom model. Sure, God is a judge because he's a father, so all of his judgments are fatherly. Let me repeat that. Let me restate that a different way. And I said this before, but I don't think I can say this too much. A father requires of his children more than a judge from defendants, more than a king from his subjects, more than a lawgiver from citizens. So while we do see in the covenant laws and judgments, what we see in the laws and judgments is the love of the father. And so now, let's take a step back and ask ourselves, how do the covenants help us to understand the Bible? All I can do now in the closing minutes of our time together is to prevent, present you with an overview of what we'd like to treat in the next several weeks. The overview is basically built upon salvation history. If you can build in your own mind, if you can draw in your mind a timeline, and you can see Adam at the very beginning of the timeline, and then we'll put the cross at the end of the timeline, representing the culmination of the Old Testament with the coming of Jesus Christ. You will see that the first covenant that God made was the covenant he made with Adam. In the Bible, the second covenant that God makes is the covenant that he makes with Noah in Genesis 6 through 9. The third covenant on the timeline is the one that God makes with Abraham in Genesis 12 through 22. The fourth covenant that God makes with his people is the covenant that he made through Moses with Israel at Mount Sinai in the books of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And the fifth covenant that God makes with his people is the covenant that he makes with David in establishing this divine kingdom, the kingdom of Israel. That's described for us in 2 Samuel, and we'll take a closer look at, look at that. The sixth covenant, then, is the new covenant that Jesus Christ comes to inaugurate in the fullness of time, as St. Paul says in Galatians 4, verse 4. Now, how can we make sense of all of those covenants? It seems as though God has a way of punctuating salvation history with covenants that he makes with his people. Now, once you see covenant in family terms, you can see why God punctuates history with these covenants. The first covenant that he made with Adam was a marital covenant. That was the family form of the first covenant. So the first covenant being a marriage covenant, the second covenant, the one with Noah, can be understood as a household covenant. The first one was simply between God and Adam and Eve. But the second one involved Noah and his wife, his, th his three sons and their three wives, eight persons in all, encompassing a household. So the second covenant is a household covenant. The third covenant with Abraham is a tribal covenant. Abraham was addressed as a chieftain. He had hundreds and thousands of people under his authority. The real crisis he faced near the end of his life was that he didn't have a son to succeed him as tribal chief. And so this third covenant takes the family form of a tribal covenant family. 
the fourth covenant then, the covenant that God made through Moses with Israel, wasn't just with one tribe, but with 12 tribes. The 12 tribes of Israel became the national covenant family of God at Mount Sinai. So the fifth covenant, the kingdom covenant with David, that involves a national kingdom covenant so that God begins to do a new thing with the people of Israel that starts to include all the Gentiles, all the nations. But at this point, the Davidic covenant was only a national kingdom. It isn't until you get to the sixth covenant, the covenant that Jesus Christ ratified in his own body and blood, the new covenant becomes an international kingdom covenant. In other words, for the very first time in salvation history, God the Father, through his eternal son, Jesus Christ, has expanded the human family, his family, to be a worldwide, all-encompassing family. The word for that in Latin is catholicos. That's why the early church fathers fixed their eyes on the word Catholic. It's precisely the Catholic nature of the church that represents the newness of the new covenant. What is so special, what is so unique about the new covenant compared to the preceding five covenants is precisely that it's worldwide. It's all-encompassing. There is no longer any distinction between Jews and Gentiles. Together they are all brothers and sisters in Christ, all sons and daughters of God the Father. It was studying the flow of salvation history in the light of the covenant family bond that led me to entertain the notion the possibility that the Catholic Church is, in fact, the culmination and climax of salvation history. I was still very resistant to many of the teachings and claims of the Pope, for instance, but I was so committed to the Bible that when I opened my eyes and my heart, I began to see that only in a worldwide family, only in a truly Catholic Church can we see the full, fledged work of Jesus Christ. So the sixth covenant is a Catholic covenant. It is the covenant whereby God has fathered a worldwide family. And I would suggest to you that there will be a seventh covenant. This will be the covenant of consummation, when at the end of time, God the Father, through the Son and in the Spirit, will raise all of the dead in Christ so this seventh covenant, the covenant of consummation, will be the cosmic covenant where we'll all experience a glorious homecoming in our heavenly family, where we'll discover something that we can only talk about now but we can't even imagine. That is, God is our home. You see, in the old covenant, the basic message was simple. God was telling us, you are my family. But with the coming of the Father's Son, Jesus Christ has opened up for us a mystery we would never have come to on our own power. Not simply that we are God's family, but now through Christ, in, in the power of the Holy Spirit, we can anticipate this glorious experience of discovering that God is our family. You see, that is the end of the ages. That is the goal of history to enter into God and to experience the life of the Blessed Trinity, this interpersonal communion, this life-giving love that the Father gives to the Son and the Son gives back to the Father in the Holy Spirit. It is our being united to that, engulfed in this eternal life and love that is, by definition, what we mean by the beatific vision. Now, if you followed me, you realize what I've presented to you by way of overview is a tall order. You are going to need to hold on tight because we're going to be doing very, very special and extraordinary things in Scripture in this series. And I am convinced it can and will transform your lives if you let it. So, what I'd suggest is this. You take those beads that Jeff spoke about. You get a timeline, but most of all, you get out your Bible and begin to read. 
in order to discover our Father's plan. Because if you do, you will come to a deeper appreciation of all that Jesus Christ has done. But most of all, you will discover who God really is, what he's done, and why. God bless you. Sera de mi